It's a pyramid scheme! Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Business Blaze. I am your boy with the blaze, Certified Legends, and if you'd like to become a Certified Legend too, head to purchasethemerch.co and pick up a Certified Legend t-shirt. You'll just have to go through a very short certification process and this t-shirt will be yours. You also have to pay for it, of course, because I need to make money. This is a video all about the worst products ever seen on Shark Tank slash Dragon's Den. I put a slash in there because I love the word slash and also in the UK we call Shark Tank Dragon's Den and in America, British people, they call Dragon's Den Shark Tank. It's fascinating. I guess in America they don't have dragons. Just before we get started, I do want to give a quick plug and ask for a favor, actually. I have a new podcast. It's called The Casual Criminalist. It's got absolutely nothing to do with business. It's certainly got nothing to do with Dragon's Den. And it's all about murder, basically. Basically, I looked at my channels and I was like, oh, especially biographics. Anytime, anytime we cover a serial killer, someone who murdered someone, someone who's a bit of a bad dude. It's just that video just does like five times as well as everything else we make. So I was like, should probably make something dedicated to that. Also, I'm well aware that true crime is enormously popular. So I have a new channel. Danny actually wrote the pilot episode for it. So go over, check it out. It's like business plays. I have a script in front of me and I react to it. It's a little bit more sedate because it's a podcast and it's also all about murder. So it's less like there's naturally less sh laugh at it's like and then the murderer removed her face and it's like oh ha 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 <laughs> because everyone likes having a face and no one doesn't like not you see why it's difficult why i need a favor from you fine people is because as i mentioned true crime is a little bit popular <laughs> on podcasts and this podcast will never get any traction or never get noticed unless i get people to actually go and download it and write a review especially if you're on itunes or apple podcasts as they call it right now so if you want to be a massive legend please do that and i'm going to give away uh probably some merch or some sh people who leave reviews so uh i have no idea like i don't know how i'm going to logistically do this but hopefully i'll give someone some merch there we go whatever i'm not committing to it <laughs> but i see myself as not a prick so i'll probably work out a way to get someone some so let's just move on it's commonly except there are links below be a legend come on it's commonly accepted that the four most important inventions to have ever come out of japan are mario compact disc players vhs recorders and godzilla also danny i've seen there are YouTube videos, so I know it's not fake news unless those YouTube videos are fake. There are vending machines in Japan which sell used women's underwear, which I found ex find extremely curious because... That smell, a kind of smelly smell, a smelly smell that smells smelly. I have no idea why that, it, that, that feels like a serial killer thing. <laughs> Like, if you're collecting used underwear, that's sort of like killing cats as a child. It's one of those, like, we should keep an eye on, John. <laughs> that f***ing psycho. Simon, don't kink shame! But if we need to add a fifth entry to that list, it would very surely be the business reality television show Tigers of Money, which is the greatest name show ever, which was first launched to little fanfare in 2001 before going on to spawn 40 different international versions. Having said that, it was the UK version God save us, which first provided the recognizable format and style which would be replicated all over the globe. Back in the day, the British were like, look, look, everyone else has to replicate our stuff. And then now, now we're like, well, we just have to make good or no one's going to use it because colonialism fell out of favor pretty hard. In the UK and Canada, it goes by the name of Dragon's Den, sensibly. In the US and several other countries, it's better known as Shark Tank. In the Afghanistan version, uh, it's called Dream and Achieve. Well, the French version sounds like a Tony Robbins book. Uh, While well, the French, French went for a slightly less imaginative, who wants to be my business partner? <laughs> Come on, France. I bet it sounds great in French, though. It's probably like, It's like, oh, French. That was the worst, like, thing I could come up with in French. But generally, French sounds really nice. But whatever the name, the format is always roughly the same. It's like my YouTube channel empire, except for business, please. But whatever the name, it's almost always the same. Not budding entrepreneurs desperately seek investment in their latest inventions from a group of well-known grumpy business tycoons, usually in exchange for a big chunk of the company. The nervous pitches and tense negotiations and blunt dismissals are usually conducted next to a table stacked with piles and piles of hard cash. 
apart from the Colombian version, <laughs> which allegedly replaces the money with piles and piles of cocaine. Mwah! And there have certainly been some notable success stories over the fo years following investments from one of the dragons, sharks, tigers, or lions. Wait, who was lion? Lions is even better. I feel like lion's den. It's better than dra lion's den, because you're gonna get absolutely ravaged. Dragons, you're gonna be like, you're not even real, are you? Lions, you're gonna be like, oh fuck. But since 2007, I've always had a bottle of reggae reggae sauce in my fridge. I don't think I've ever had that, but I know the story of it. The deeply wonderful barbecue sauce with a Jamaican jerk spice was first pr uh, touted by musician Levi Roots on the UK's Dragon Den. Despite the fact that Levi's pitch started off with him getting out a guitar and performing a cringeworthy song about his new sauce to the initially bemused dragons, Reggae Reggae sauce went on to become a sizzling triumph and Levi Roots is now worth about 45 million pounds. Holy sh Levi, respect. Put some reggae sauce on your list. Thank you. Like, I like Dragon's Den. It's a show I, I often watch the clips on YouTube. And my biggest thing is like he can play all the music he wants. Someone can demonstrate the project all they want. I would just, I'll, I'll just be the dragon sitting there with my notepad and be like, how much have you sold? What is your profit margin? How long have you been in business? Do you have any patents? What's the competition like? I don't give a f about your product. I am a businessman. Like, if it does some good, great. But look, if your business is digging dinosaur juice out of the earth and putting it in cruise ships, but your profit margins are 90% and it's good to invest in, I'll be like, I could probably overlook the ethical considerations because it's a show about business. It's not a show about being super ethical. Although, I mean, you're on TV, so you don't want to come across as a complete dickhead. What am I doing? <laughs> Meanwhile, over on the US version of Tar Shark Tank, a reusable scrub daddy super sponge with a smiling face on it managed to shift over 10 million units. Most notably, the Squatty Potty, a little foldable bamboo stool that you set up next to your toilet to assist with easier bowel movements, has incredibly managed to rack up $33 million worth of sales following Shark Tank investment, quite probably helped along by the killer marketing slogan, the number one way to do number two. That is incredibly cheesy. Also, I've heard the Squatty Potty advertise because I think it's like it, at least a couple of years ago it seemed to advertise on every f podcast there was and I'm like wait it's what it's just a thing that you put your leg so you're taking a right and you want to be like how do I demonstrate this I'll climb up on my desk so you want to like take a mostly like so normally you want to get like really like as if you're in a squatting position so it has this like shelf which you raise your legs up onto and I'm gonna get down demonstration over i'm just like why not just put a plastic box down there or like a foldable thing that you buy at home base for 50p i just don't get it And although the show is often seen as cruel entertainment in which hopeful but clueless entrepreneur wannabes are brutally ripped to shreds by the panel, the statistics show that most of the participants seem to have their business heads screwed on the right way round, even if they don't always secure investment. Yeah, I also feel like the producers of the show. They select mostly people because they don't want to waste the dragon's time too hard. But occasionally they'll pick someone and be like, you are going to get absolutely destroyed. And we need at least one of those per episode. It's like, we need someone who's going to get investment. We need someone who's going to be close to getting investment. And we need someone who has no idea what the f*** is going on. And it's always that guy. He's the most... There was one, there's one glorious one. Just Google search Dragon's Den Pyramid Scheme. And there's a dude who literally pitches the dragons a pyramid scheme. And I believe it's Peter Jones who often just sits there with a mean look on his face and then he absolutely destroys him. It's like, it's a pyramid scheme though, isn't it? You, it's a pyramid scheme! Considering that 11 of the 12 out of 12 new business startups in the US were doomed to fail in 2019, the figures from the US version of Shark Tank are quite impressive. Over the previous six seasons of the show, only 6% of all participants are no longer in business and only 20% are not making a profit. That's pretty good. Bearing that in mind, it's been suggested that the sharks would probably make a lot more money if they just blindly invested in every single product that gets pitched to them, but that wouldn't make very exciting TV. Still, that's not to say that we haven't been thoroughly entertained over the years by a number of bizarre products from nutty inventors who found themselves drowning in bolts of brutal flame dished out by the sharks and the dragons and the tigers and the lions. The mirror, oh my God, is this the first entry? Is that, was that really the introduction whistle? Get your 
Shit together, son. The mirror hardly ever lies. The business world has always been positively bulging. Sam, He-Man meme. Uh, with products that promise to help you miraculously you lose weight as you sit around in your pants and stuff yourself silly with 20 giant packs of Monster Munch. Oh, Danny, you bringing up Monster Munch on purpose because I mentioned how distasteful I find it in previous episodes. It's f***ing disgusting. And I bet you're one of those Monster Munch kids. You're all like, <laughs> you don't like Monster Munch. Ah! Do you not have taste? But if you finally given up all hope with that packet of obesity bath powder which failed to live up to its marketing hype, you might want to take a look at the product that Belinda James was pitching on Shark Tank in 2017. Belinda decided to take a radically different approach to the weight loss challenge. If you're really finding it difficult to shed those extra pounds, why not completely give up on the silly idea of weight loss? Just get your mirror to lie to you instead. I don't know. Because weight loss isn't all about looks. It's about unclogging those arteries. It's about leading a healthy life. It's about not dying young. It's about, you know, you looking good to other people. Yes, Belinda had invented a vi uh, variation of the kind of concave mirror that you'd usually only find in the fairgrounds. This is perfect for people who love lying to themselves. This is the worst idea ever. Why am I surprised? This is all about Shark Tank failures. When a customer looked into her new skinny mirror, they'd see a version of themselves which would appear to be 10 pounds thinner. Belinda believed that the new business idea was worth a million dollars. It's not. And she was generously offering the sharks 20% of the company for $200,000. This is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> it gets even worse, though. She didn't intend to sell to these customers who fancied feeling a bit better about themselves. Belinda only intended to sell the skinny mirror to clothing stores so the customers trying on new outfits would be delighted at how stunning they look in their fab new gear, completely unaware that they were peering into a haunted mirror of deception. Oh, so they were going to lie to their customers. This is actually, this is actually a very good idea. But it's also very, very unethical and definitely something that companies would get in a lot of trouble over Belinda. I'm not fat, I'm big boned. The harsh truth would only hit the poor souls when they got home with their exciting new purchases and saw how they really looked in a proper mirror that wasn't designed to bend and distort reality. On this topic, what is up with clothing stores? Because it's like, I look in the mirror and it's like a normal light. I feel like, you know, I, I, I look okay. Every clothing store, it just has those bright, if you're not in the changing rooms, you know, if you're just looking, you know, you're looking, I know why it is. Oh my God, I know why it is. I just figured it out. How could I have been so dumb? Like you're browsing around the clothing store, right? And there's those mirrors and you never look very good in them. And I never worked out why. I mean, it's all because of those bright overhead lights that just shine directly down on you and they make you look terrible. They make your skin look bad. You get the weird shadows. Your clothes look all rumples. And then you go into the changing rooms and you look in the mirror and everything looks good. And I just figured out why. It's because when you're shopping in the store and you got those mirrors, you're like, man, I look like a piece of I need new clothes. And then you take those new clothes and you try them on and you've got a way better mirror in the changing room and you look good and you're like, oh my God, I must buy these clothes because they'll make me look good. How am I just figuring this out now? I was wondering this my whole life. <laughs> During the pitch, Belinda cheekily asked the slightly portly shark, Kevin O'Leary, if he fancied having a look in a skinny mirror but he wasn't playing ball. Yeah, dude, that's not appropriate. In fact, he said, the truth is you're lying to people. I'm out, but I also forbid any other shark from investing in this. Balls, Kevin, but also he's completely right. He obviously didn't really wield that kind of power, but he needn't have worried as none of the other sharks are interested in investing in a product built on the principles of deceit and perpetuating unrealistic body images. On reflection, that was a pretty fair outcome for the skinny mirror. But a on reflection, I almost missed that one, but I didn't. Hand in glove. As we've discussed recently on Business Place, forgetting to drive on the right side of the road in a foreign country can lead to tragic consequences and even international wrangling over fudged diplomatic immunity laws. Yeah, there was a woman who was married to a plumber or something, or an electrician on a US base, and she killed someone by driving, like, distracted. And she was like, diplomatic immunity. And it was like, your husband's a plumber at the, like, American military base. And she was like, yeah. It counts, doesn't it? And the Americans were like, yes. And the British were like, oh, yes. An absent-minded moment from US citizen Anna Sekoulis, Anne Sekoulis, led to the accidental death of a teenager in the UK. I just managed to tell, I, I already told this story, I'm just gonna skip ahead. But maybe such painful incidents as this could have been avoided if the UK dragon had paid more attention to inventor Mike Carr in 2007. The appropriately named inventor approached the dragons with a groundbreaking new solution, which promised to solve the problem once and for all. In fact, Mike firmly believed that he had come up with something that was destined to be regarded as the greatest driving safety product of all time and would save hundreds of needless deaths and accidents 
every year. I have to say, this is, I mean, there have been situations where, I, you know, I go to the UK or I'm in Europe, you know, and you're driving on the other side of the road and it's like, yeah, yeah, I've made errors. And then it's like, oh, I'm on the wrong side. I was on a motorcycle trip once in Sri Lanka with a, a friend of mine who's, who's Austrian. And in Sri Lanka, they drive on the left. In Austria, they obviously drive on the right. And we were like riding our motorbikes. And he sets off before me. And he's riding on the wrong side of the road around a corner. And I'm like, Alex! Alex! And he's like, what? Looks behind, goes over to the other side, and then a bus comes around the corner. I'm like, what, dude? You're f***ing welcome, Alex. I can remember watching this episode at the time and feeling intrigued by the question of how exactly Mike was going to solve such an issue, which was more about lapses in human memory than anything technical. The answer was a bit about anti-climax. Mike Carr presented a single white glove, which he dubbed the Drive Safe Glove. There was nothing remotely special about the glove, but Mike's idea was that when you were driving abroad, you would first slip the single glove onto either your left or right hand, depending on which side of the road you're supposed to be driving on. This does nothing. I mean, you've got to remember to drive on the left side of the road, but you've also got to remember to put the f***ing glove on. It's also just a white glove. It's like, just go to the golf store or wherever Michael Jackson buys shit. This would act as a permanent visible reminder to stay on the right side of the road at all times or the left. The glove, uh, 2,000 years too late. But the dragons were quick to slam the emergency brakes but about Bob on the idea uh, as the invest as investor Richard Farley politely remarked, something tells me this isn't going to work. Was Richard Farley the Australian one? Be like, Something tells me this isn't going to work, mate. I don't think this is a good one. Hard pass. My car may have been driven away from the den, but it's believed all these years later. He's still trying to get the drive safe glove into mass production, despite the fact that even if you quite like the idea, you could surely achieve an identical effect by just wearing a glove that you already own. Yes, £100,000. Are you smoking crack? Wake and bacon. Hey. I supposedly enjoy quite a privileged morning routine in that I only have to ring the bell in my basement to alert Simon that I've woken up. At this point, he'll stop scrubbing the outside steps and make a start on cooking my full English breakfast. You're welcome, Danny! But I recognize that other people aren't quite so lucky and usually just are just awoken by the rude blaring of an alarm clock which signifies that you need to crawl out of bed before getting a chance to prepare anything as civilized as a cup of tea or a slice of fried bread. Just imagine if you could wake up to two whole rashes of crispy bacon that you could enjoy in bed before making any solid commitment to get up and face the world. This was the idea that led Matty Salin into developing the Wake and Bacon, a product with such a wonderful name that I suspect he may have come up with the first name first and then built a product around it. Yeah, this is the worst. Don't do that. Don't do that. The name is not that important. The Wake and Bacon was a new breed of alarm clock that didn't need an actual alarm. Instead, the little wooden box with a cute pig's face on the front would wake you up with a sizzling aroma of freshly cooked bacon. If it's actually real bacon in there, and it's cooking it for me, I'll be like, that's legit, I'll put on the toast. But if it's just the smell of bacon, that's gonna be incredibly disappointing because I know the reality of it is I'm just gonna have like a bowl of cereal or something because I'm not gonna bother to cook bacon every morning. Before you climb into bed, you simply slot two rashes of bacon into a little tray at the side of the box. The device's halogen lamp will start heating it up about 10 minutes before you're due to rise from your slumber the next morning. Okay, that's pretty cool. But you're still gonna, I mean, one, isn't that gonna get nasty overnight, especially in the summer. It's like, I wanna leave bacon out overnight. Matt, and also too, you gotta to make all the extra go along with the bacon. Matty had even come up with a brilliant marketing slogan, Rise and Swine. Yeah, Matty's a brilliant marketer, what a hero. When he approached Shark Tank for investment in 2011, he was looking for $40,000 in exchange for a 20% grilled steak uh, in his wake and bake business, wake and bacon business. But the sharks, I imagine Matty is a dude who talks a bit like this. But the sharks were not in the mood for making any rash decisions that day, brah. I feel like there's that, that, that stage people get to. Where it's like, look, everyone likes, you know, it's 420 all the way, man, you know, no worries. But there is a point where you've just smoked so much weed that you sound like you've sm you're smoking weed all the time, even if you're not, and even if you stop. I don't know what it is, but it's just like, it just gets to the stage where you're just talking all the time like this. I don't know what's happened, man, but it's like all the time you just talk like this. And people are like, it's fine, it doesn't make you slow. And I'm like, look, clearly it does. <laughs> Anecdotally, there are definitely people who smoke too much weed, and now it's like they're smoking weed all the time, even when they're not. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. What is up with that science? But the sharks were not in the mood for making any rash decisions on that day. But a bum bum. 
This is filled with puns. The atmosphere turned sour when it was revealed that you would have to sleep next to two rashes of raw, unrefrigerated meat for the duration of every single night. And the sharks pointed out that the novelty was likely to wear thin very quickly when your bedroom began to absolutely reek of greasy chunks of dead pig. Another more pressing problem was, that the, was the fact that the sharks perceived the box as a dangerous fire hazard. Considering that smoking in bed has long been frowned upon, it does seem <laughs> it's long been frowned upon. Yeah, no sh like if you want to die. I, I think cigarettes put themselves out automatically these days. I'm not sure. But look, don't smoke in bed, kids. Don't smoke in general. It does seem something of a backward step to suddenly introduce the concept of automated baking cooking in the bedroom before you've even woken up yet. All the sharks passed on the investment opportunity, although Kevin O'Leary did jokingly offer to buy the single pig box that Matty had brought to the pitch for a couple of hundred dollars as he wanted to put it in his museum of really bad ideas that kill people. Kevin O'Leary is a bit of a legend. He's got quite a good YouTube channel as well. It's quite a laugh. When I was a student, I did have a coffee machine. The, uh, it was like a, a drip coffee machine, and I'd put the coffee in there every night, and I had one of those, I didn't buy an expensive one, you know, that has a timer on it. Like, I have, a, I have like a fancy drip machine now, and you could time it to go off in the morning, and it makes delicious coffee, and you can choose the strength and all that <laughs> This one was just something I picked up like for five quid at Asda, and I also bought one of those one pound uh, timers that you plug into the plug, and it turns on a specific time, and I'd have that bad boy make coffee in the morning for me, and I'd wake up to the smell of coffee, and I was like, cool. This coffee smells like shit. It is shit, Austin. This is absolutely glorious and how life should be. Despite the rejection, the project still seemed to attract interest from thousands of viewers who seemed genuinely keen on shoving bacon into their mouths before they'd even made a trip to the bathroom. But unlike the little piggy you went to market, the wake and bacon doesn't appear to have made it quite that far. <laughs> Super knees. You know your pitch is going badly when you're thrown out of the room before you've even had a chance to open your mouth. The orthopedic entrepreneur, uh, Stipen Sorlich, arrived on the UK's Dragon Den in 2005, showing off his latest invention, super knees. They were essentially a pair of roller skates which you strapped to your knees. Stipen had apparently spent six years researching kneeling activities and concluded that there was a gap in the market for a tool that would help people who spend all day working on their knees to get around a bit quicker. Dude, no. Super knees enabled the user to whiz around from chore to chore with speed and ease while never having to rise from the kneeling position. <laughs> Who the f is this? Ah, this would surely be an ideal tool for people who shine the shoes of very long queues of customers and full time grovelers. There's a whole niche on YouTube of people who like craft make things and restore things and I absolutely love it. It's one of my like, I mean, you guys must get the impression that I watch a lot of YouTube. It's because it's absolutely true. I think there is an absolute demand for a channel where people make the failed products from uh, Dragon's Den and Shark Tank. Like someone making a functional version of that bacon thing or the super knees or what else did we have? Well, you can easily make the glove one. Just go to the golf store. What else is there? The mirror that hardly ever... That one's also fairly boring. But these more interesting ones, people should def... That would be a great niche. <laughs> Aside from that, though, I'm not sure if Stipen's target audience was as big as he might have hoped. Well, sadly, you never know how much Stipen was hoping to raise in investment from the dragons or just how much of a su of super knees he was willing to surrender. After kicking off his pitch with a short demonstration of super knees in action, the dragon Peter Jones responded with, Please don't tell me you've given up your life to develop super knees. <laughs> I love Peter Jones. <laughs> he's so brutal. And it's just like, please. He, he's not, you know, he's not like, you're a dick. This is a terrible idea. He's like, please tell me you haven't made a huge, huge error. At this point, all the dragons collapsed into hysterics and Stipen left the den without ever getting the chance to speak a word. But maybe he had the last laugh. Although Super Needs didn't exactly set the world on fire and no longer seems to be in production, it did enjoy modest success for a short while in Spain, Israel, and the Ukraine. What the is going on in Spain, Israel, and the Ukraine. I don't imagine three countries that are more different. The Ionic, the Ionic, Ionic, yeah, maybe. Finally, they say that you should never peak too early. But in terms of sheer lunacy, the US version of Shark Tank arguably peaked with the pilot episode in 2009. This was back in the days when Bluetooth headsets for mobile phones were all the rage, and it briefly looked as if the whole world had succumbed to madness as everyone walked around the high street seemingly having conversations with themselves. I like how that's just completely normal these days. Like, I'll have my earpods in and I'll be talking to people just doing phone calls. And it's like, yeah, of course, it's just normal. On the plus side, this was good news for nutters who really were having fierce arguments with themselves, but now just looked like they were engaged in very important business with the Tokyo Stock Exchange. I mean, yes, I guess. But it's like my business phone calls that I do while I want, you know, walking around. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. I could try that. Yeah, we can do that. 
Yeah, very interesting. Good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Whereas the raving lunatic is like, THE MAN ON THE HILL! JFK! Fine level was an inside job! Neil Armstrong's a terrorist! I bet there is a conspiracy that Neil Armstrong is still alive and is a terrorist. <laughs> There's just so many. Darren Johnson was an enthusiastic Bluetooth headset user and spotted a problem with the sweeping trends. The earpiece would often move around a bit too much in your ear, interfering with the quality of the call. Sometimes it would even fall out of your ear altogether and end up getting lost. But never fear, because Darren had a quick and handy solution that was destined to change the uh, hands-free telephonic con conversation forever. I say quick and handy. It was actually an alarmingly drastic solution. Please don't tell me they're like removing people's ears or actually modifying someone's body. That would not be good. Darren's new iconic ear was a Bluetooth device which you had surgically implanted into your ear canal. Holy sh**, dude. So you never have to worry about losing that visor connection ever again. You'd be disappointed when AirPods come around. You're like, oh, it's a lot better than my implanted one, isn't it? You know, you get to enjoy such things as stereo music and noise cancellation. The device would need charging up from time to time, but Darren had that covered too before you got into bed at night, around about the same time as you're shoving raw unrefrigerated meat into your wake and bacon. You simply inserted a Q-tip sized charger into your ear hole so that your iconic ear would be all fired up for tomorrow morning's thrilling telephone calls. Darren was seeking a cool million dollars for a mere 15% in his company. Wow, that is that is a valuation right there. But other sharks seemed particularly interested in listening to what he had to say. Part of the problem with the pitch, quite apart from the fact that the product was absolutely bonkers, is that Darren seemed a humorless soul who failed to back up his invention with any qualifications, or testing, or science, or credibility. His stone-cold reaction to the sharks, creasing up with laughter at the absurdity of his idea, only served to make the whole pitch even more uncomfortable and cringe-inducing. I do love some good cringe, you know. In that respect, it was an odd choice to appear on the pilot episode, and perhaps not very representative of the more promising candidates to come over the next decade and beyond. Darren's super dry pitch, which sought an absolute fortune for a balmy product that hadn't even been tested, was clearly not going to go down well with the fresh sharks. Barbara Corin, apparently, I don't think I've really seen American Shark Tank very much. I've seen a few. Summed up the mood of the room when she declared, This is the weirdest damn thing I ever heard. But a bum bum! Darren Johnson now seems to have vanished off the face of the earth. And it's speculated that he may have even changed his name to try and bury his association with a pitch that is widely regarded as one of the most ridiculous in the entire history of the show. He may have been one of the show's original stars, but it would appear that Darren Johnson is now very much out. Maybe he took a good long look at himself in the mirror and realized that entrepreneurialism wasn't for him. Or he just took a good long look at himself in the skinny mirror of lies and basked in the own glory of his own all-consuming genius. This has been an episode of Business Place. Thank you for joining me on this blazing journey. It was a fun one today. If you'd like more of these, Danny actually said, Simon, there is a lot of room for follow-up if this does well. So if you like it, smash that like button. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to check out that podcast. Links below. Stay legendary. How am I just figuring this out now? I was wondering this my whole life.